You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. Tom and Barbara are talking about markets in London. Barbara has a market list, and she wants to find out more details about them. Listen to the conversation, and complete the market list. Write no more than three words for each answer. Look at questions one to six. Hi Barbara, what will you do this weekend? Well, I'd like to do some shopping, but I have no idea where to go. I've only been here a few days. I was told London is an expensive place to live. Yes, but that's not completely true. London can be an expensive place to live, but if you shop in the right places, you can live relatively cheaply. Is that true? Could you tell me something about the shops? All right. You know, food tends to be cheapest in the big supermarkets like Sainsbury's and Tesco's. Most of them have quite a good variety of food and household items. You can buy your fruit and vegetables on the street. You will find these street markets in almost every part of London. You can also buy clothes, shoes, and household items in these markets for a real bargain. Have you got a market list provided by the student union? Yes, here you are. This might give you some ideas. Let me see. E Street, SC17. This market sells cheap food, clothes, and hardware. It's open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yes, but how can I get there? You can take the underground. We call it the tube. You see, there is a tube station on the list. Let me see. Yes, it's Castle Station. Right. You can get off at the castle. Good. Look at Leather Lane, WC1. Yes, that's a good central London market for clothes, food, and hardware. It opens at lunch times from Monday to Friday. It's near Chancery Lane Station. Well, what about the one in Petticoat Lane? Oh, Petticoat Lane E1. It sells clothes, shoes, and household goods. It opens only on Sunday mornings from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Yes. We can get off at Oldgate Station. Okay. What about the one in Walthamstow, E17? Oh, that's a big market for clothes and food. It, it's open between 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Mondays to Saturdays, except Wednesdays and Sundays. Let me see. Yes, we can get there on the Central Line. What about Brixton? That's Brixton SW9. It's an indoor and outdoor market. With a lively atmosphere, it sells vegetables from all over the world. It opens 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Mondays to Sundays, and half days on Wednesdays. Oh, it's close to Brixton Station, very near my place. Great, it's very convenient. Tell me more detail about Camden Lock. Yes, there are several markets on Camden High Street, and plenty of shops. They sell fashion clothes. Jewelry, recorders, and pottery. It's good for buying presents. Very close to Chalk Farm and Camden Town Station. I see. It says that it opens on Sundays only, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, I think these markets might help to keep my costs down. Well, if you need to buy new electrical goods or large household items, you can wait until the January sales, when almost all the shops sell goods at discount prices. Thank you very much for your help, Tom. 
Shall we go to Brixton together this weekend? I'd love to. Oh, I'm afraid I've got to go to a lecture. I will ring you tonight. Bye. OK, bye. Barbara is phoning Tom about shopping. Look at questions 7 to 9. Now listen to their telephone conversation and answer questions 7 to 9. Write no more than three words for each answer. Four oh one oh six two five. Hello, is that you, Tom? Hi, Barbara. Have you decided where to go tomorrow? Yes, that's right. I want to go to Camden Town to shop. Would you like to go there with me? Yes, I'd love to. That's a good market. Mary's here with me now. She wants to go there too. Shall we meet at Camden Town Station? OK. How are you going there? We will go there by bus. It's only three stops from my place. Well, we might walk there if the weather is fine. How will you get there? I think I will have to take the underground. I'm at Bond Street, and I'll take the central line first and get off at Tottenham Court Road. That's it. Take the central line and get off at Tottenham Court Road. Then you want the northern line to Camden Town. It's only about four stops. Make sure you get a northbound train, though. You want northbound Camden Town, OK? OK. I think I can find the way. I have an underground map with me now. What time shall we meet there tomorrow? How about 10.30? Well, I think that's a bit too late. It might be crowded by that time. How about one hour earlier, say 9.30? Fine. That'll be all right. See you tomorrow. Bye. That's the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a radio presenter interviewing a man about the Sydney Harbour Bridge. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Well, good morning again, everyone, and welcome to Perspective, the weekly New South Wales radio programme on subjects of general interest from our local area. Today I have in the studio Mr George Simmons. Good morning, George. Good morning, Anne. So what are you going to talk to us about today, George? Well, for people from New South Wales, and particularly Sydney, this will be of great interest, I hope. I'm going to tell you a little about Sydney Harbour Bridge. Wow, that would be so interesting. I think so. To start with, I'd like to tell you a little about the size of the bridge. The arch span is 503 metres, and the weight of the steel arch is 39,000 tonnes. The summit is 134 metres above mean sea level, though it can actually increase by as much as 18 centimetres on hot days, as the result of steel expanding in heat. The two pairs of pylons at each end are about 89 metres high, and are made of concrete and granite. The steel used for the bridge was largely imported. About 79% came from the United Kingdom, but the rest was Australian made. The granite was quarried in Moria down the coast, and the concrete is also Australian. So most of the steel used to make our great bridge actually came from England? Yes, I'm afraid so. However, the workforce were all Aussie. Thank God for that. When was the bridge actually built? The bridge was opened in 1932, but work first began in 1924, with the construction of the bridge approaches and spans, with two separate teams building the arch on each side, working towards each other. The arch was successfully joined on August 19, 1930. 
I'm afraid that working practices weren't very fair in those days, and the local government demolished 438 homes which were in the way of the approaches, and as many as 800 families living there were displaced without compensation. The standards of industrial safety were inadequate too. 16 workers died during its construction, mainly from falling off the bridge. I didn't realise that. Yes. The bridge was formally opened on the 19th of March 1932 by the Premier of New South Wales, Mr Jack Lang. When it was opened, it was the longest single-span steel arch bridge in the world, and it was one of the greatest engineering masterpieces of its time. Several songs were also composed in advance for the occasion, but these have now largely been lost or forgotten. However, three postage stamps were issued to commemorate the opening of the bridge, and these still exist. One of these stamps, with a face value of five shillings, is now worth several hundred dollars today. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 17 to 20. So that's the history of the bridge. Is the bridge still the same today as when it was built? No, it's quite different. The basic structure is the same, of course. Originally, the bridge was constructed to carry a road, two sets of tram lines and railways. In 1957, the two tram lines were removed when Sydney abolished its trams, thus giving the bridge two more traffic lanes. Today it carries eight traffic lanes, two railroad lanes and a footpath along its eastern side. One of the eastern traffic lanes is now a dedicated bus lane. The bridge is often crowded and in 1992 the harbour tunnel was opened to help carry the traffic load. More than 160,000 vehicles cross the bridge each day. Before the harbour tunnel was opened this figure was as high as 182,000 and would be much higher today if it were not for the tunnel. Pedestrians, horses and push bikes are not allowed on the bridge anymore. Wow! The bridge actually carries that much? Oh yes. Actually, before the Harbour Bridge opened, it was completely packed with railway carriages, trams and buses to stress test its load-bearing capacity. While it has had many traffic jams since, and half a million people walked across it on its 50th anniversary, it has probably never been asked to carry that much of a load since. Amazing. And I suppose the toll for crossing the bridge has changed a bit too. I'm afraid so. The initial toll charged for a car was six pence, while a horse and rider were charged three pence. Today the toll costs three dollars, but is only charged when travelling to the south as an efficiency measure to speed up traffic flow. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear a discussion between students Maria and Jack. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about their opinions about some of the things in their universities. First look at questions 21 to 24. Note the examples that have been done for you. Now listen to their talk and answer questions 21 to 24. Complete the table showing the weather, the rooms, their roommates 
and food. Two four one four double three one. Good afternoon. May I speak to Jack Robert, please? Speaking, please. Hi, Jack. This is Maria. Hello, Maria. How are you getting on there? Fine. I arrived in Nottingham yesterday. I've just settled down, and I live on the campus of Nottingham University. Oh, that's good. Do you like the campus? Yes, it's beautiful. What do you think of yours? Edinburgh University. It's marvelous. It's on a hill and very close to the sea. I like it very much. It sounds beautiful. Jack, what's the weather like there? Oh, it's fine and sunny. It's said that the weather here is very nice in summer, but awful in winter. What's the weather like in Nottingham? Well, it's a bit depressing. It's been raining since yesterday. I can't go out, so I have to stay in my room. What about your room? Is it a nice one? Yes, it's small and elegant. How about yours? Mine is an ordinary one. It's a twin study room. I share it with one of my classmates. He's intelligent and very friendly. We're getting on quite well. How's your roommate? She's very nice, but a little bit quiet. She likes reading and seldom speaks. By the way, do you like the Scottish food there? Oh, I like it. It's very delicious. Oh, really? I don't like the food here. It's disgusting. It has no taste. I have to cook for myself in my room. Well, Maria, as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Come on, don't be too choosy. Oh, someone's at the door. I have to answer it, Maria. I'll call you this evening. Bye. Bye. Ellen, a student union officer, is conducting a survey about the university facilities. She is asking two students about their opinions. Look at questions twenty-five to thirty-two. As you listen to the discussion. Complete the table showing the number of points: one, two, three, or four, awarded to the university facilities by two students. One has been done as an example. Now answer questions twenty-five to thirty-two. I'm Alan, and I work for the student union. Now I'd like to hear your opinions about a few things in the university. We've asked for some volunteers to help us conduct this survey into how satisfied students are with the university facilities. First of all, let's take the lecture rooms. We could score them, for instance, one is excellent, two satisfactory, three rather poor, and four really bad. Robert, you first, please. What do you think about the lecture rooms here? Not so good, I'm afraid. I would score three. They're too small for one thing. Sometimes we can hardly find a seat. Yes, but that doesn't happen very often. Personally, I think they're all right. They're comfortable, and the acoustics are quite reasonable. It doesn't matter where you sit; you can always hear the lecture. I would give two for them. How do you feel about the car parking facilities? Are they adequate? You must be joking! I can never find a car parking space when I need one, and when I finally do. It's a very long walk to the university's teaching building. I'd give it a four. I'm afraid I also agree. We need more car parks urgently. This is perhaps one of the major shortcomings of this campus. It gets a four from me as well. I come to the university twenty minutes early just so I can drive around looking for a parking space. What about the computer centre then? I think it's first class. The software base contains a large selection of learning programs. Language games and word processing facilities. I would give a score of one. I quite agree with you. It's very modern and also under the supervision of qualified staff who can offer help to us while we work, should we need them. Oh, good. Well, what do you think of the library facilities? Let's say the periodical room first. Well, I've scored that three. 
I'm sorry to have to say, but uh, I think the room has poor lighting, and I'm disappointed about that. I've given it a score of one. As far as I'm concerned, it's excellent and well stocked. Thank you, Robert and Mary. Now let's turn to the photocopying facilities. Hmm. I would give it a score of two. Personally, I think it's all right and it's very helpful. Huh? I would score three. I think it's too expensive for photocopying, and there are not enough machines. Sometimes we have to stand in a line. Okay. Now let's talk about the. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. In section four, you will hear a talk and answer questions thirty-three to forty. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-three to forty. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-three to forty. Ladies and gentlemen, at Safeway, we're committed to working for a better environment. We have been actively looking for environmentally responsible solutions over the last twenty years, and it has never been more important than it is today to continue with that initiative. We believe our actions are helping to solve some of the problems, but just as importantly, we're looking ahead too with new ideas to help protect our environment for the future. Action for the environment goes beyond the Safeway store and into your home. What can you do? Here are some practical things you can do when you get back home to help the environment. Sort out your waste at home so that you can take the different types to be recycled. Recycle all you can, such as glass bottles and jars, plastic bottles, textiles, newspapers, and plastic bags. These are among the many things that can be recycled today. Your recyclable material can be taken to your local Safeway store's recycling centre. Or to your local council recycling centre. Use recycled paper at home and at the office if possible. Recycle for the garden too. Food scraps such as decayed vegetables and fruit, but not meat, and some garden waste such as leaves, dried grass. These can be used to make compost. It's useful in the garden and helps conserve the countryside. Compost is a good alternative to peat. Peat digging damages wild peatlands. Reuse as well as recycle. The back of once used paper can be used again for rough work. Old plastic bottles can be cut in half to be used as clutches for seedlings, and yogurt pots and plastic film canisters are ideal for storing small things like screws and seeds. Don't forget, plastic carrier bags can often be used again. We can all take action for a better environment if we start now. We can make a difference and enjoy a cleaner and brighter future. The environmental problem is one of the crucial problems we face now. 
Energy efficiency cuts down the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is the main cause of global warming. People say we live in a throwaway society. In other words, waste is building up. We really need to find a way to solve this. Recycling and reuse can stop the build-up of waste and can help save energy. Using CFC-free alternatives or pump-action aerosols is one way everyone can help. Every grower, from a farmer to a gardener, can help to save wildlife and habitats by avoiding the use of artificial chemicals, which can poison plants and animals and pollute the land, air, and water. There are plenty of environmental problems facing the world. Small but consistent environmental actions by everyone can help to make sure they do not become overwhelming. It's remarkable how the different environmental actions work together to prevent a variety of problems. You can buy 100% recycled paper goods for the kitchen and bathroom. As well as recycled bin bags, buy environmentally responsible products. Try to use products that do not contain chemicals that can do harm to the environment, such as phosphates, chlorine, and solvents. Regular purchases will begin to make a difference. To save energy, when it's convenient, walk or cycle. It's good for the environment, your health. And for your pocket too. In the home, cleaning jobs can be carried out with a thought for the future. Use the washing machine on low temperature cycles. Use public transport when you can. Get a timetable. You may find a convenient alternative to the car, and you will avoid the problem of where to park. Share a car. A sociable way to go to work or the shops. Two sharing a car only uses half as much fuel as if they had driven alone. Use unleaded petrol if you can. We're all responsible to make the world a healthier, safer place for all of us in the future. That is the end of section four. Now you have half a minute to check your answers.